you know, I would say performance is personal. So for, you know, I always use the example of somebody running their first 5K at the chemo. Uh, that's as personal as in an Olympic athlete training for gold, right? It, it means as much to them. And, and, and for me, sometimes that, that, you know, you call them kind of, uh, but that, that kind of active amateurs, they actually sometimes have way more adaptations to make, right? Um, if you're going couch to 5K, uh, as opposed to somebody who's been training for, you know, a distance event their entire life, you know, some of those those metabolic adaptations have happened. So it is kind of as as important, the, the recovery plan um, to, to the kind of active amateur as it is to the elite athlete. All right, team, welcome back to The Athlete's Pursuit. So today... On the show, we have a very special guest, someone that we are very excited to have with us on the show. He was the very first sports dietitian full time in the NFL with the New England Patriots from 2004 to 2012. He was also the sports RD for the University of Michigan in 2012 to 2015, served on the board of directors for the Collegiate and Professional Sports Dietitians Association, and is now the director of sports science with Thorn Supplements. So welcome to the show, Joel Totoro. We are very excited to have you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So this, we have so much to talk with you about, but I got to dive in with the very first thing, which is this was a big deal, Joel. You were the very first, this blew my mind, the first dietitian in the NFL. How does that even come about? Yeah, a uh, little bit of timing, a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, awareness and, and preparation, but, uh, no, the, the crazy thing is that the, the field of sports dietetics and, and sports nutrition is, you know, still really in its infancy. I mean, that was, you know, 20 years, not even 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, at the time, like you said, it was me full time in the, in the, in the NFL, there was a handful of us at the college level. And, and now you've seen just about every power five conference has, you know, one to three, if not more. Uh, sports dietitians, you know, it's they're pretty, pretty much every every team has uh, at least a, a consultant, if not a full time sports dietitian. So it's been a crazy run in the last uh, kind of fifteen years or so. Yeah, I feel like this role of nutrition has played this incredible part. I mean, now it's incredibly common that we're talking about nutrition as it ties to performance. It's just like this common knowledge thing that we all understand a little bit. But yeah, for sure. Even from my side, uh, Joel, you are you are a well-established dietitian, someone for a lot of other dietitians to look up to. And even to the point now where it's it's very much branched out of even collegiate and uh, and professional sports, you know, gyms like the one that we are associated with and other gyms, especially in the city, they are asking for sports dietitians knowing that we can kind of break through some of the nonsense that might be out there, but just kind of like be able to, you know, I think we've used this term before, but just kind of clear the weeds a little bit and help people understand exactly how to, how to elevate their performance and not uh, harm really their health on the other side. Yeah. So, but Joel, when, when did you kind of notice the shift really happening? Like we're in this place now where it's kind of common knowledge. You come in at the beginning where it's, I think they're starting to maybe accept this, right idea that nutrition is playing a vital role, but what were some of the challenges you were even facing to make your role prominent to, to prove the value that you were bringing to the team? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, kind of the awareness that came, you know, as, you know, athletic training and, and physical therapy kind of moved in and everybody, you know, every team had one of those. And then, you know, strength and conditioning went from, you know, way back in the day, it was just an extra line coach to, okay, there's some science here. Let's build an off-season program. So as those kind of got established, you know, the, the good coaches like Bill Belichick, innovators were, were looking at, okay, what boxes aren't we checking, right? Where Where is there an edge to be had? And that's where, you know, sports nutrition and the kind of, um, you know, integrated, you know, performance team kind of started happening. You know, we kind of saw sports, sports psychology start kicking up around the same time. Mm. So it's really just, okay, the athletes at the center – what, what are we doing is to support them 360, right? Not just when they're in the building or when they're on the field. So it was kind of a, a paradigm shift there and just a competitive kind of advantage, um, you know, on the, on the you know, management and, and coaching side. And down, but and then on the flip side, you know, once, once you kind of connect with somebody, they, we saw it a lot. As I said, there, there was a little bit more of establishment in, in collegiate ranks where we had players coming from a, 
you know, from a Texas A&M or from a Nebraska that were like, Hey, we had one. Why, why isn't there one here? Mm, so, yeah. so, so a lot of it was player driven off as well. So, oh, wow. um, you know, it's just kind of an awareness once it wants you can be aware of, of how nutrition and, and fueling and recovery, you know, interacts with the body, both on the wellness side, but eventually on the performance side and any little edge. Um, it's kind of a mix of those factors of awareness and, and the growth of the profession as well. You know, when I started, uh, I was very fortunate uh, at the University of Connecticut where I went. Uh, my professor was Dr. Jeff Bullock, who was a PhD in exercise physiology, was kind of grew up in that. The whole creatine research at Penn State was kind of his area. Um, so he was exactly kind of what I wanted to be in the in the field. But that representation wasn't there back in the day. So I was really fortunate to, to have someone in front of me to see, OK, this could be a potential career path down the road. And Joel, when you were working uh, with specific athletes, were there were there metrics that you were using that you could actually see the work that you were doing with them to truly you know, measure your your success, uh, your role with them? Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of metrics. So the, the first one everyone goes to is, you know, kind of weigh in the body compositions. And it's, it's crazy to think about. It. There was a time when, when I was educating, you know, kind of everybody on, uh, you know, you can weigh 225 a lot of different ways in, in that, you know, you can do some work and lose some fat, gain some muscle. And, you know, it's not necessarily always just setting a weight goal. Like every linebacker needs to be within five pounds. So, um, really teaching, coaching up, you know, some of the coaches and some of the, the other decision makers that, um, you know, body proportions and heights and torso length, all these things fl- play into how much you can, you can weigh and, and what, what a body composition means as opposed to just, uh, a random weight cut where you've got guys doing damage to their body just to kind of hit an arbitrary number. So that was, that was the first one we kind of looked at was setting, you know, goals around that. Um, The great thing is we had, you know, I worked initially under Mike Wojcik, who's, you know, he's had six Super Bowl rings. The guy pretty much invented the off season. So he had an established program that had, you know, years of data. So we could kind of look and and see were people making uh, strength gains a little bit faster, were injuries down, all these things that are are correlated, Mm -hmm. but, um, it's just kind of looking at, you know, and like I said, we had an amazing team there. At New England, so it was looking at, is the overall athlete improving? Like, do we think nutrition's making a, uh, an impact? And, and, you know, obviously it is if you go from, you know, having somebody in the building, you know, a couple of times a, a, a season to, uh, you know, someone there every day to really look at everything from, you know, morning to nighttime to what you're doing, mm-hmm. you know, when you're not there. So um, just any intention around it is obviously going to improve uh, outcomes. Um, but you know, as with anything, it's winner or loser as a team, right? So, you know, you're, you're judged every Sunday, you know, on your work indirectly, you know, like I said, I, you know, eight seasons and I have zero carries for zero yards, but, um, you know, there was some impact, uh, you know, there's an impact along the way. I don't think I've ever won a game, but I think the performance team may have helped, you know, maybe prevent the loss or two. It's all part of it. Do you, do you have a Super Bowl ring because of these, uh, these efforts, Joel? I do, yeah. There it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got a, uh, I've got a uh, two, two uh, AFC Championship ones that aren't as, aren't as fun, you know. That was a, that was a tough, <laughs> tough road, but no, it was great just to, like I said, even be part of the support team behind you know, those great uh, achievements is, is unbelievable. That's absolutely amazing. That's uh, a clear sign of success. I would say some jewelry. Um, I got to ask you, you mentioned that, uh, was his name Mike? Was, was your Mike Wojcik, yeah. He designed, yeah, so, so he, the off-season, you're saying he kind of designed the off-season. I'm kind of curious going down there, like what, what shifted? Yeah. How did that change? So he started, and I, I, I'm, you know, telling his story, not mine, but uh, he started, uh, you know, he was long-term um, track coach and strength coach at Syracuse University and went down to uh, uh, the Cowboys for that first initial dynasty, right? So he built that dynasty up, and, you know, some of the stories he tells is, is kind of Michael Lerner was just wasn't wasn't really ever done training he always wanted something to do you know so they kind of put it a little bit more intention mm-hmm. around the you know the, the idea that people would stay around in the off season and, and get you know it wasn't just you know they're i mean we're not all that far from, from players having uh, jobs in the off season you know back in the you know the Steelers and Packers days right so uh it was the idea that this was football was a year-long um commitment you know years you do all this damage during the season you take the off season to recover but also you know train the body for the coming season you know what's going to happen right mm. I, I call it intentional trauma um you know it, it it's where you know if you know things are going to happen and this damage going to the body and there's, uh you know adapt uh adaptations that need to happen and you know it's going to happen you know why not plan for it right mm-hmm. 
you know, that's kind of a, a model we can, we can kind of touch on this a bit. But I started my career in the, in the ICU in clinical, and it's, it's funny how much kind of translates where, you know, there, there was damage to the body there, um, on, you know, unplanned, unintentional, you know, but, you know, at the end of the day, you start looking at the, the you know, some biomarkers of uh, offensive linemen that's, you know, getting into 20, 30 mini crashes a, a day. Uh, on game day and then you look at the same kind of blood marker for somebody who's been in a small car accident like are they that much different Mm. and and does the body care right so the damage was done how do we how do we kind of take care of it and respond to it and joel i was i was so i'm so I'm, i'm curious how we can find that bridge between all this work that you've done with professional athletes um and where where we kind of start with with people who we really consider these like urban athletes who really are putting them you know a lot of people are putting themselves to the ringer they're spending you know hours on end uh, either in an office or at a desk um, and then they're putting themselves through not as much trauma as some of your offensive linemen here but they're they're putting their body through a lot of work and so we would love to kind of dive in and try and find where those parallels are between the people you know, in whatever city or wherever they're living uh, in the country and they're working out incredibly hard, how can we take what you've learned on how to keep your professional athletes healthy, training, uh, you know, not showing signs of overtraining, how can we have that translate to the people that we're really working with? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot there. And, and, and you know, the, at the end of the day, we're all kind of, I say, I would say there, you can't have human performance without the human, right? So a lot of the truths for elite athletes you know, while there may be, you know, genetic differences uh, or, or adaptations and there may be, uh, you know, some skill differences, but in reality, the, the same things are kind of happening. Right? The body is still kind of going through the same motions. And, you know, I would say performance is personal. So for, you know, I always use the example of somebody running their first 5K after chemo, uh, that's as personal as in an Olympic athlete training for gold, right? It, it means as much to them. And, and, and for me, sometimes that, that, you know, you call them kind of, uh, but that, that kind of active amateurs, they actually sometimes have way more adaptations to true make, right? Um, if you're going couch to 5K, uh, as opposed to somebody who's been training for, you know, a distance event their entire life, you know, some of those those metabolic adaptations have happened. So it is kind of as as important, the the recovery plan um, to, to the kind of active amateur as it is to the elite athlete and uh I think, I think one of the things I've learned in, in my career is at first I kind of always wanted to go to the top end, the top 1% and, you know, look at some of the, okay, what, what protocols are we doing here? How, how do we get that last 1%? But in reality, uh, it took me entirely embarrassingly too long to get there. Uh, but it was the, it's the vitamin D's, it's the magnesium, it's the iron, it's, it's all these little things that if, if you're not taking care of those first, kind of the foundational needs, uh, your body's never going to invest the, the energy into getting to that next, that extra 1%, right? Uh, you know, so I, was, I would say, and, and I'm sure I stole this from somebody, but the the body is a, it's a survival machine, right? So all it, all it really wants to do is not die, right? That's its primary objective every day, right? So it's, it's always kind of triaging what the biggest threat to survival is, right? And, uh, you know, so that's where, you know, if it is the training that's a stressor, if it's, you know, um, I was using an example, like, you know, we all think, you know, we go out to, for a drink after work or whatnot. Uh, that's still a little bit of poison to the body. It doesn't care, right? We know we did it on purpose, just same thing, intentional trauma, right? Mm-hmm. We're doing it on purpose, but for your body, at least initially, it's like, whoa, we got to clear this toxin. Like, we're not mm-hmm. doing this. We're not focusing on, you know, muscle recovery. We're not focusing on, you know, fat burning. We're not focusing on anything besides clearing this toxin, right? So same thing, and, and we talk about... Um, you know, one of the challenges for the, the kind of, the, the, I guess the benefit a professional athlete has is it is their full-time job, right? So they have time to, you know, sit in a cold tub, get some treatment, you know, have, you know, personal chefs, have everything mapped out for them. You know, for the rest of us, we're doing a job and then doing this second job of training, right? So um, it is kind of stepping back and looking at, okay, what is my recovery protocol? It's not necessarily that I had a two-a-day practice, but I did, right? So I did my full-time job. I dealt with that. I used brain strain, you know, I, mm-hmm. you know, I was under stress. I was dealing with that. So I had everything I needed to do for that. And then I'm going to add this physical insult to it, you know, again, on purpose and we're happy to do it. But, um, so it's really stepping back. Like what was the totality of the day? Right. Um, 
And I know we talked a little bit earlier um, in preparation for this call about the idea of stress and how many people forget that uh, it's a cumulative thing, right? Like, you know, you, you clearly we've all got a little bit more of it going on, you know, between COVID and, you know, I think we've all been, you know, tied to CNN. So that alone is stress, right? right. Before we, we even look at, okay, but then there's physical stress that like did damage to my body on purpose by training. And then there's, did I fly in an airplane? Do I live in a busy city? Like everything that happens to your body has a biological cost and a metabolic cost. So it's, what are the, what are the nutrients that I'm overusing, you know, and, you know, and, and am I replacing them? Is my diet strong enough? Mm-hmm. Do I need to ramp up fruits and vegetables because I'm just uh, doing so much more damage to my body, you know, like things like that. And it, it, it's just stopping and thinking like all these things are happening because we don't, we don't really think about, um, you know, we, you know, we lift weights or we, we train and, and you get some physical soreness and that's pretty obvious. And we're like, okay, I need an answer for this. But, um, you know, it's not as easy to diagnose like, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, my central nervous system is fried. You know what I mean? I'm overtired. I'm under recovered. Um, those are, are things we, you know, it, it's tough to push through a, you know, if you killed yourself and you're at one of those, like, you know, you did an upper body and it, it hurts to brush your teeth, right? <laughs> then, you know, you're, it's a rate, rate limiting factor, right? But when you fry your central nervous system or, or, you know, any of these other pathways that aren't as apparent, it, it's not as like, we don't have that governor that physical pain has for, for training. So it is understanding that, you know, that, you know, sometimes we have that day where, you know, the, you know, we have brain fog or <clears throat> we're just not as sharp or, you know, our weights are down, you know, 25 pounds on each exercise in the gym. It's okay to realize like that's not an effort thing. That's a uh, under recovery thing. Right. Yeah. And I think we're, we're quick to say over training. I I'd say in my opinion, more people under recover than over train. Right. I think I'd agree with that. Interesting. And- it almost sounds, I feel like we can make an argument here that a lot of these these urban athletes, again, that we call them, that they're almost doing more, that they're under more stress. It's what you're saying almost than some professional athletes, not to take away from how hard they're going at it in the game, but they have a little bit more time to recover and a little bit more focused recovery compared to someone who is now leaving the gym after having maybe over overtrained. Um, or just done enough training, they go home to either a family by themselves, they're having stress from work, they're having stress from money, they're having stress from just being in the city, all this other kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I, when you end up talking, Joel, about uh, this under recovery, I think what a lot of people don't do is that they don't define themselves as somebody who needs this kind of recovery. Like, well, you know what? Supplements, uh, you know, uh, you know, proper sleep, this and that. They're basically saying... I don't, I don't define myself as someone who requires it, so I'm not going to give it to it. I'll just eat this next salad and I'll be okay. Right. It's like, it's someone that's just under eating, under fueling. And we have to pull people out of that and be like, Hey, this is what you actually, you actually require. You need this. You're working yourself out. You almost deserve it. Yeah. And I think it's, I think one of the biggest things, and it's one of the biggest uh, kind of motivators for me is when I'm working with somebody and whether it's physical pain or energy or sleep uh, when you get, make an intervention and, and somebody actually feels better and then they're reminded like, Oh, this is how I'm supposed to feel every day. Right. Like this shouldn't be like, I, I shouldn't have to live with pain. I shouldn't have to live with, uh, you know, um, fatigue or, you know, just fighting to get through that 2 PM meeting. Right. These don't have to be true. They're true because of choices I'm making and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, patterns I have. Uh, so there's tons of ways you can, you can change behavior too. Like, you know, I was, Kind of you can you can make a you know a conscious decision like okay I'm gonna go to bed earlier I'm gonna turn my blue light off I'm gonna read a book instead of my tablet like there's all these behavioral changes we can make you know and then there's um, you know metabolic changes we can make sure we're we're feeling correctly sometimes it's a supplement you know sometimes it's you know meditation on the you know psycho psychological side like mm-hmm. there's all these different things we can do to to, to impact how we recover you know and it's not like, obviously my my favorite part is the, the food and supplementation part. That's where my, my kind of bread and butter is. But uh, you'd be naive to, to think that there doesn't need to be an answer for every one of those kind of stimulus. So any, anything that you've taken out of your body, what's the plan to, to put back? And, you know, for, you know, I've worked with, you know, everything from, you know, actively, you know, sick and injured people to, you know, kind of the urban app that you call it, the high performer. Um, you know, cognitive performers. So things like mm-hmm. e-gaming and race car where it's uh, significantly more 
you know, well, there's a physical drain, but there, there's a lot of mental drain, right? And there's, mm-hmm. you know, you're using your eyes nonstop. So how we, you know, what are the nutrients the eyes use? So this, it's kind of once you stop and think like, okay, what did I take out of my body? What, what do I need to put back in? That it becomes pretty, pretty clear, um, you know, and then as much as there, we kind of, I guess the bridge gap there, as much as there is a ton of uh, metabolic and physical stuff that the, the, the third piece, like, you know, I say, you, you know, if you're training, you need to make sure you, like there's a train a plan for that. There's a physical recovery, you know, for injury and whatnot. And there's a metabolic one. Um, but then there's that central nervous piece. And that's kind of where to me, you can't have a, if you're going to have a strength and conditioning program and you're going to have a nutrition program and you don't have a sleep hygiene program, then you're just missing a third of it. Right. That's where a ton of the kind of the, the, recovery happens on one level but it's also kind of where we process what happened during the day you know like the way it was best explained to me is you know you've got this part of your brain that's you know basically everything that happens in the day is a little thumb drive right that's uh it's sitting in the middle of your brain and then and then when you sleep it actually gets uploaded and that's where memories happen that's where you know uh, an athlete can take coaching it's just you know it's where you things kind of become permanent and when we don't pay attention to that, so there's, there's that side of it. And then there's obviously a lot of the physical recovery and, you know, we've got a whole biorhythm that turns things on at night and turns things off in the day and kind of manages again, that, that survival mode. Um, but yeah, so, so kind of taking advantage of all three of those areas, you know, is your sleep good? Is your metabolic good? Is your physical good? You know, what are you doing kind of for your brain and central nervous system? Yeah. Kind of have to have an answer for that, whether you're, you know, you've got a, a board meeting tomorrow or you're giving a presentation like that, the stressor, um, you know, as much as, you know, having a competition during that same time slot. All right. So how do you start? So Joel, all of this, what you're saying, I think is making so much sense. And where there's so much more of an emphasis on recovery today, I'm trying to anchor this a little bit in practicality of, you know, that person that is that quote unquote, urban athlete, this is so much to think about, right? I think like to do these things and nail these things down, I'm curious what, what you would say are the priorities for one for recovery, because there's a lot that we can do, right? I mean, you mentioned meditation, you mentioned sleep, maybe, um, you know, putting the phone down at night. And these are, these are some things that, you know, I think we've heard kind of before, but it's, it's almost seems like there's so much it's all good advice, but how do you prioritize? Because we can't be perfect, right? And then the second thing, how do you identify what's causing you stress? Like how do you as a person kind of start to slow down and pinpoint if what is causing your body to not recover appropriately, if it's physically related based on your training literally in the gym versus environmental stressors? How do you start to identify the difference between the two. Yeah, I think it's uh, a little bit of a uh, introspection, you know, obviously is where, where everything starts. You have to be kind of true to yourself and, and, you know, ask yourself questions, answer appropriately, but it, it's paying attention to, okay. It, it, once you realize that, okay, my physical training load plays into my energy level the next day at work, my sleep impacts, you know, everything I do, it, it is all interrelated. Once you kind of realize that, then you can kind of be a little bit, okay, this is true that this is happening to me today. What, whatever my deficit is, what's different? Where, where was I lacking? Right. And a lot of us can pinpoint it pretty quickly. Right. And I think, you know, as uh, wearables and different technology comes out there and we have more data points, uh, it leads us to those uh, decisions a little bit faster, you know, depending on, on what you, you know, what different metrics you, you, you choose. And obviously the more data points, the, the kind of closer to, to a pinpoint assessment mm-hmm. you can get, but, you know, it can be as simple as, you know, I've used things, um, you know, as simple as, uh, you know, like a 10 question questionnaire, like what was your recovery score? And it went through, you know, sleep and diet and all these things. Uh, and, and, you know, athletes started realizing, and again, this can be applicable to anybody. Um, okay. My score, like when I'm a seven out of 10, like my bench is down, my, you know, three point shootings down, like all these things. And they start making that connection. And that's when it's like, okay, did I, well, I walk off the court? Did I get my, uh, my immediate feeling, right? So at least I have that taken care of, you know? Okay. So I'm taking care. And, and a lot of it, I, I guess to get back to your initial question is, is what are you willing to do? Right. What, what's your, your readiness to change, you know? So for some people it is, you know, the, the easiest thing is, okay, I'm just going to go on this restricted diet for a week because that's, that's the, the thing I feel most comfortable controlling. Right. And then from there, okay, what changes actually happened out of that and how do I make this 
Uh, for other people, it is a behavior change where it's like, well, I'm just going to set my alarm. I'll go to the gym every morning. That'll reset this, whatever. Um, you know, and for some people, it's like, okay, I, I don't have time for to make any major changes. But what I will do is I'll take this foundational vitamin or I'll take this, you know, vitamin D for, you know, all the different impacts it has on the body. So, so it, it really is the, the readiness of where you are. And once you tackle one thing, um, and, you know, you pay attention, okay, I, I am feeling a little bit better. And again, there has to be some intention and self-reflection to, to kind of assess yourself daily, yeah, right? right? And see where your, your, your wins and losses were for the day, um, which is uncomfortable for, for some people. But, uh, you know, I think if you're, if you're training and you, you have a, a performance goal in mind, uh, even if you just look at it that lens, you know, eventually it'll, it'll, it'll trickle out to the bigger parts of your life. But, yeah. um, you know, I think, I think just being honest and looking at tying the two things together, like if you have a deficit or you have a great day, um, stop and think like what was different that made that happen. Right. And it's, you know, I kind of, you can go head to toe. It's like, you know, what, you know, was I attentive? How was my focus? Uh, how was my sleep? Okay, cool. Physically, how do I feel? You know, internally, how's my health? Am I, you know, simple thing like allergies can throw you off in the gym, right? Can throw your sleep off, right? For sure. You're not breathing as well at night. So it's all these little things and it takes a little time to kind of basically play Dr. House on yourself and figure out what's going on and what the kind of secret ingredient is. But um, it comes pretty quick. You get to know yourself pretty well. And I I think that's one thing that differentiates elite athletes from kind of the the urban athletes that you talk about is, um, they've been taught to be that perceptive, right? So you do, and you are judged daily, right? The film doesn't lie, you know, your effort yeah. doesn't lie. So um, they have to get to these pinpoints where they know like, oh, wow, I was a little bit better today. What did I do? So it's forced because it, it's kind of, you know, a lot of us, we can just uh, like either it's on me, it was an effort or I need to just gut it out. I need to be mentally tough. It's just a whole mm-hmm. other conversation. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, we don't, we can kind of, give ourselves a pass or lie to ourselves a little bit more. Whereas at the professional level um, and the elite level, like there's just, it's in your face. You can't lie. There's numbers, there's metrics. There's, you, know, you are judged positively and negatively every day. So sure, um, that's a big point. That's, that's one difference. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's that, that's that buy-in. So it sounds like the buy-in is a little bit easier with a professional athlete. When you have all those metrics, you have numbers, you have, you know, the scoreboard to Feedback actually show. Daily. Yeah. And I think that what uh, a lot of these urban athletes are not doing so much is that they're not really sitting. You know, we talk about stillness. We talk about uh, just self-reflection. And that's not happening as much as maybe these professional athletes end up getting because it's almost in your face. You're like, well, your leg is going to break. Your ligament's going to snap. Your score is not going to be as high if you don't do these things. Yeah. And this person over here maybe is doing that. And so... That buy-in is important. This try it sounds like just, I mean, it's just an honest answer. I think you just gave Joel of just, this is a trial and error process. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I speak to people from the training side, I know that people just want a clean answer of like, this is how it's done. And this is what you prioritize. And it's steps one through five. And it's like, it's just not like that. Like this is a, such a lifelong thing of, cause what you're saying is that you're analyzing and just pretty much taking in data of how you respond to outside events and to basically what we called quote unquote trauma to the body, right? And if I do too much of this, I feel like this in the morning. If I do this, I feel like this. If I drink this, if I eat this, if I sleep like this, et cetera, we're really just collecting data points and just refining, right? So it is this awareness game, as you mentioned, so that you can start to fine tune. If I want this result, this is what has worked for me and this is what I maybe need to prioritize from there, right? Yeah, and it, basically what you're what you're kind of forced into, and, and thankfully we're getting better with uh, science and, and, a, and access to information. But you have to be your own coach, so you have to be critical of your performance, right? You have to be your own sports performance team. You have to be your agent, right? Like, is this the best for my long term future, not just the season, right? So you have to be all these for yourself, and you know, by all means, build your network and, and you know, have some help with that, and kind of build your, your you know your CEO of you, build your cabinet around you, but. Um, to, to really, if you have a performance goal as, as small as it seems, uh, the way to get there the fastest is just to take this assessment of, okay, what do I need for now? What do I need for next training? You know, like cause there's times when in our schedule, our post-workout meal and fueling uh, is also our pre-workout potentially for the day. So you can get up and run in the morning or mm. I just, you know, I just did all my day of work. My post-work fueling or recovery is also my pre-workout. So like really just understanding like, what's happening now? What, 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 so I guess, what did I take out? What am I lacking? What's 
missing from my last training session and my last life session? Um, what am I going to use in this next hour or two hours of training session? Is that available or do I have a plan to replace it at the end? And once you kind of start like building those success plans, then it kind of just becomes like, again, it's a, it's like a lifestyle. It's like athletes don't necessarily think about a lot of the stuff they do. They just, you know, you, you know, you stretch before practice and you foam roll after like these are yeah. things. It's just like, yeah, obviously it's, it's, it's more than habit. It's just life. Right. Yeah. So I, I think part of it, I think that's the big part is, is having some, you know, we use the word intense or block, but um, you know, really just having some intention around like, what am I going to do? What's the cost of it? What's my plan? I think what's important to remember here too is like these athletes, I think what makes them perform at such a high level and prioritize this stuff, like their performance and their recovery too, that's important to mention. And we talked about this last week was like, you have this such clear cut vision of what you're trying to accomplish. Like they have such, that's what I love about sports. Like there is such a clear goal. You are, you are winning it. You want to win a championship. It is like just black and white. I want to win a championship, and make the team better. So they're so tuned in to what they're trying to do that each person's role, they understand what they have to do. So of course you're prioritizing recovery. Of course you're prioritizing sleep, which I would imagine in your day, then you're probably saying like, no, I'm not going out tonight. I'm, I'm sleeping tonight. Right. Or I'm stressed out. So I'm going to say no to this so that I can do what I need to do. And I'm going to meditate today. And I do think that this happens where most of us in regular daily life don't have that. And so you fall into these traps where I think you're more going into like a short-term kind of pleasure over a long-term kind of goal that you have, right? So we give into, I'm going to go out on Friday night because, you know, I, I'm not going to prioritize my sleep because I have no idea why I would prioritize it today. I don't know what I'm trying to accomplish, right? This happens so much. Yeah. And that's very well said. Um, Joel, I, I, have a, I, have a, I have so many questions I want to ask you. But one thing is that I think that you end up stepping in and doing so much teaching. Um, so I'm curious, what is it that maybe you learned or you took away yourself, uh, you know, whether it's in performance or just overall life from working in that area? Yeah, so I think, I think there's a lot of things. Um, I, I think uh, one of the biggest things, and we see it in, you know, any kind of coaching areas, we learn, like I learned, you know, uh, the biochemistry, you know, I mean, you know, all the classes we take to be a, a registered dietitian that are super technical and super scientific, but like, I'm not sure I learned how to be a coach in the classroom. Right. And a little bit, I learned, you know, I knew like most of my patients were uh, non communicative communicative. So, I mean, I learned how to work within a team in that ICU setting. Right. Because we all had to be in communication because the, the, the patient couldn't always, you know, be that answer. But um, you know, so, so going to that, to the, from a kind of a, I would say like a dietitian has to be a, a somewhere between a professor and a coach um, because we do have to, you know, we are speaking to some pretty intense metabolic processes, but on the flip side, like if, if, if I'm over your head, then you don't understand why, like, you know, I, for some people I can just be like, just, just, you know, drink the protein shake after work. They're like, all right, cool. I trust you. Right. But then other people are like, okay, why, what's it do? Whatever. So right. you have to be able to back mm-hmm. up your, you have to be able to back up why you're, you're saying everything you say, but, so I think the, the biggest thing was learning to coach. I think another thing was learning that, um, you know, while nutrition is the most important thing to me, it's not necessarily always the priority, right, in the whole ecosystem of, of health and wellness and performance. And, you know, if they're physically unable to, uh, you know, to do a movement, I, I was talking about, like, you know, if there's, a, if there's a running back that can't pick up a third down blitz, like, it could be, you know, a training load issue cool, we'll, we'll bounce over to the, uh, the strength and conditioning staff, you know, and kind of reassess that. Is it an overuse injury? You know, cool. Let's look at the, the physical therapist and athletic trainers to take care of that. Is it a fueling issue? Is it, you know, then, then I step up, right? Is it, um, you know, uh, an attention or something with the, you know, the mind? We've got a sports psychologist to look at that. And is it a combination of five different things that, you know, because he's under fueled, that triggers, you know, mental focus, like whatever. So either it's a one of us in the team or all of us in the team, but, yeah. you know, to kind of step back and, and realize that my part is to make sure that uh, the, the parts of performance and recovery that I can control are controlled. There's an answer for that within the team, right? And that I know what, you know, the physical therapist and the athletic trainers need metabolically from me, right? What, what is the feeling? What, what rehab is going on? Are, are they feeling that? What uh, recovery from, from injury? So, 
surgeries going on. What are the nutrients for that? Same thing with the strength conditioning. If I don't know the load, uh, the training load, you know, of, of what an athlete's going through, where we are in the off season, I can very aggressively overfeed or underfeed. Um, you know, so it's just really understanding like where you live in that space and then realizing that, you know, not everybody has that structure around them. So how do we make that kind of checklist easy for the urban athlete and, and make them realize like, okay, this is what's happening physically. This is what's happening. Uh, nutrition wise, this is what my stress level is. So, uh, I think that was kind of the biggest idea is, is understanding that uh, I have a role to play, but I can't play my role without uh, without accounting for everyone else around me. Which, you know, it, it's kind of it's how you know Bill coaches on the field. Like you can be a middle linebacker, but if you don't know what the secondary is doing behind you, how can you make the best decision for the team? Mm-hmm. I think it's so, great. Uh, I think it, it's teaching you like you yeah. can't you can't walk in there with an ego, right? You have to be able to know your role, and if you don't, you're probably not going to be able to give the best support you possibly can. Yeah, and that's that fine line of, of, of confidence and, and preparedness mm. as opposed to ego and kind of uh, uh, un, unearned confidence, right? Mm. So, uh, which a lot of a lot of times we like run that. into, right? So uh, you have to have enough of a, a ego to to hold yourself accountable to be the the you know the expert. And it's funny, I learned that same lesson. Uh, I've told this story before, but my my I was. Uh, you know, two weeks out of college, sitting in a ICU grand rounds, and you know I'm 22, and uh, you know I was scared out of my mind. And uh, infectious disease doctor was like, "Hey, you know the most. Like, you, we need you to step up. You are the nutrition expert on this panel. Uh, we don't know anything about it." And I was like, "Oh, okay. So it is now my responsibility <laughs> to go into grand rounds. This is on me here. You know, making life or death decisions." And I was like, "Oh, I need to come every day, right? So, you know, it's the same." You know, same in the sports world, in the medical world, there's just, you know, the wins and losses, life and death. But when you are, when every decision you make is judged and seen, you know, I would say that, you know, working in athletics, working in, in medicine, there's perfect or fail. Like there is no, there's no good job. You know, you either did exceptional and that was expected of you, uh, you know, or you didn't, right? So there is that, that kind of level of uh, consequence there that uh, kind of, I think, drives your, your preparedness and your, your self uh, motivation mm. you have a question I, I do but go ahead oh I, 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 want, I wanted to transition a little bit over yeah. to more of the cognition kind of stuff but yeah. I want to make sure that if we have any more questions about performance because there's so much and it's so interesting I do have one I do yeah, have one please, before yeah. we go there yeah, do it. so we, we I wanted to touch on this because we mentioned the central nervous system a little bit but mm-hmm. CNS is I don't think everybody is really familiar with what that really is specifically so CNS fatigue I wanted to make sure that we really clarified for people what that is, what happens to the body and why it happens. And then, and ways to just kind of uh, get through it. Um, and I'll have a follow-up question with you, Joel, but, but let's, let's just kind of clear up. Like what is CNS fatigue? What causes that in the first place? Yeah. So like, as, as I mentioned, every, everything you do has a biological cost and a metabolic cost, right? So, you know, the central nervous system, it, it's our governor, right? It does it, it kind of, you know, runs through everything, but it, it's how we react, respond, you know, with, you know, when you stop and think it almost gets like a little bit overwhelming when you stop and think about like, uh, if you're ever for some reason, like aware of your breathing or, you know, aware of your heart rate, and then you stop and think like, Oh, this is all happening without me even thinking about it. Right. And that's kind of, again, one of the learnings from the ICU, you, you start to realize like how many things are happening all at once. And then when you realize like how much it takes just to be alive every day, like I said, we are that survival machine, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's, I mean, we use ton of calories, like just, if just to lay in bed and not move, like there's a huge metabolic cost for that. Right. So that's when, you know, you kind of look at, you know, you see all these recommendations not to go below a certain calorie average for the week, or whatever, but um, it is because you need to feel that, that baseline survival. Right. And then, uh, you know, everything you do above and beyond that, like I said, whether it's, you know, the stimulus of, you know, if you cross the street in New York city, like your brain is processing so many pieces of information just to survive their, that crosswalk. Right. And it's why a lot of us see, and this is a whole, again, another deeper conversation, but it's why all of us feel that, that connection to nature that you you know, you have to, there's a lot less stimulus, you know, there's no one around, it's quiet, it's open, okay. you know, but you know, you hear, you hear a twig snap, and, and your body has to be, you know, ready to survive, right? So we, we see how, you know, you would never hear that twig in, in you know, New York City and, and see that as the biggest threat. But, you know, so your body's just 
always kind of switching between hmm. that. But, um, you know, so there are, there are like those loads on the body, whether, and, you know, if you're sick, if you have a diet, if you have, you know, any kind of inflammation in the body, um, you know, there's so many different things your body has to uh, account for just to survive a day. And that's before we, uh, add insult to it intentionally with, with training and with, <laughs> right. you know, with other things we do uh, as positive forces uh, are positive causes of, of damage and stress. So, um, so yeah, so, and I, I think a lot of people do forget about it and, you know, it's, it's so complicated to even, it, it's tough to even kind of dumb down how intricate it is, mm. um, to, uh, to an approachable level once you start to realize how much is really going on. But, but the, just the idea that, that everything we do just, you know, again, laying in bed, breathing, thinking, you know, keeping your heart rate, keeping your temperature. These are all things. Any one of those goes out of whack a little bit. Right. We get some pretty catastrophic events. So, right. So, uh, just knowing that everything you do has a cost and then kind of, so what are your baseline uh, costs for the day? And then what did you do? Like how much extra did you put into the body and realizing you do have to take care of that and kind of, uh, you know, there is some, some issue to being either chronically stressed or chronically under recovered where, your body just never gets, the, you know, so if it's a short time, you did a training session, cool. You know, you, you, you give your body some protein to let it know like, Hey, it's okay to start recovering. This isn't going to be the cause of, you know, lack of survival, but you know, that's a short window of, of uh, kind of uh, departure from just the basic survival mechanism. But, you know, if you're doing it every day, there's, and you know, if you're not sleeping every day and you're, you know, your diet's poor or you're, you know, you're just not getting enough energy to get through your, your workout and you're doing extra damage. Mm. Um, those, those lead to some downstream effects where you're just never really getting those, um, all your systems. You, you don't really get to that, the, the whole system check, right? It only gets to like the first like four steps and then there's a lot of things that are left um, chronically. And that's where we see things like, um, you know, vitamin D deficiency, magnesium deficiency, just those chronic illnesses popping up. And it's just kind of for, and it's aggressively simplistic, but it's basically like your body just didn't get to those. You know what I mean? They just weren't triaged enough, high enough on the to-do list for the ah, day. That's a good way to put it. Um, so we'll, we'll go into what you were talking about, but I think like this is important to understand too with with like your body doesn't know the difference going back to what you were saying like when we're, when we're in nature like there's not all these external stimuli around us right we so we hear we hear something like a, a tree uh, a, a branch break we're going to be alert to that when we're in new york city walking around it's like there's a million branches breaking around us every second of the day so you i feel like your body doesn't know the difference between a real stress like life threatening stress versus just city living right sometimes so your body's still responding in a similar way just like how you say there might not be a difference between trauma of like someone in the icu to you just put on willingly physical stress on the body and training your body's still responding the same regardless if it was intentional or or not intentional and so just staying here for a second with this and the signs, right? So we're basically talking about the CNS, that connection really with your brain, your spine, sending all these signals around your body. Yeah. The signs of uh, of this CNS fatigue, making sure that we know that it could be something, uh, you know, as, as complex as insomnia. It could be loss of appetite. There could yeah. be injury involved, correct? Um, there could be other things. I'm just looking through even notes here. But just like in terms of like perceived effort, I always love talking about studies that I find that are uh, on like increased perceived effort. But when these when these signs po uh, pop up and people are kind of running through the things that they should really be um, checking out, okay, you know, sleep. Okay, you know what? Actually, I'm sleeping pretty well. Nutrition, all right. Well, you know, working with a dietitian or someone, my, nutri my nutrition looks pretty good. Training, maybe I'm not really over training, but I'm feeling all of these, all of these, uh, all these signs that we're talking about right now. Is there something, Joel, that you would say, you know, could be missing? And may maybe this is where you've seen it within professional athletes or, you know, the, our, the, the urban athletes we keep talking about. But maybe these are more of those micronutrients. Uh, and you've mentioned some. You've mentioned the vitamin D. Um, I think magnesium might kind of fit within here, too. But are there, are there some that we should kind of, like, keep our eye on if we kind of feel like, you know, okay, CNS fatigue, we're seeing what we're talking about. These are the signs of CNS fatigue. We're crossing out kind of the big items, but now we have to get down into some of the the more uh, I don't want to say minutia here, but just like the smaller things, yeah. like the those micronutrients, maybe maybe where the supplementation would come in. Are there certain things that you've seen that 
uh, more people have kind of uh, needed like that iron or whatever it might be? No. So uh, I think I think you're spot on. And, and, and I alluded to it a little bit, um, you know, and, and it was one of the failures in my my career to not understand uh, faster was how much, you know, demand is put on an athlete. So we looked at um, a bunch of uh, NFL are hopeful. So training at the combine. Uh, so all guys coming from power five conference, you know, it was after, you know, NCAA deregulated feeding. So there was kind of, uh, you know, there were no limits on the food. They almost all had a dietitian they were worked with, you know, kind of uh, just great support staff around them. And, you know, we saw a ton of deficiencies, um, some pretty staggering numbers. Um, uh, and it were, and you're seeing more, more coming out of the college ranks on, on nutrient levels, but it was, you know, magnesium and vitamin D, you know, I've, I've worked with athletes that, you know, clinically they would be if this was, you know, ICU or whatnot, some of the levels on, on magnesium and vitamin D were, were problematic, not just in, a, in, they weren't suboptimal. They were actually like, this is a clinical thing we need to address. Right. So things like vitamin D, things like magnesium, uh, omega three index, which is kind of your balance of healthy fats to kind of, you know, not, or, or just enough healthy fats in the body. Um, you know, that's everything from cognition to, you know, managing inflammation and muscle issues and you know really everything but uh it's one thing it it was traditionally hard to measure same thing with vitamin d magnesium um you know you have to get down to the the kind of red blood cell level on magnesium because it's in bones and it leaches so Mm -hmm. you know just getting a serum blood level and you know it's a it's a deeper conversation but there's some things you just can't track in the blood so uh until we knew it was important enough to test for or you know cost of testing came down um that's why we're starting to see these this all like I always talk, there's a, what do we think? What do we know? What can we prove um, at the professional level? And a lot of times at the personal level, uh, until we have access to, to extra tests and, and, you know, research protocols and whatnot, we can never actually, you know, we don't prove, um, you know, we, we think we know, or we think that we, you know, maybe we make an intervention and we, we, we can assess, you know, kind of objectively um, or subjectively, but, you know, more and more we're seeing, and, you know, Thorne, it's kind of one of Thorne's missions is to decrease the, the barriers to that personal recommendation. So knowing what is true for you. So, you know, it'd be great if everyone could just get uh, access to their blood draw, you know, their physical blood draw every year, uh, if they do a physical every year and then just have an understanding of what those, those markers mean. And we're getting, we're getting the science a little bit better to people. Um, when we mentioned earlier, when we were talking about training, like there is no, like, I can't give you a weight gain diet. I need to know so much more about you. I think something we struggle with a lot of times is especially with the uh, social media and the influences, what worked for one person didn't work for me, or I don't know the variables at which that worked for that person. So, um, you know, so many times I've worked with an athlete where, you know, that, you know, I, I've had to do two completely different, you know, I've done, you know, I've had vegan athletes, I've had keto athletes, I've had, you know, everything in between. And there is a, there is a way to, to do that. And it sometimes it is understanding, what works for that person. And, and it used to be all trial and error, but now we're getting to the point where, you know, as science catches up, we have a couple of things like, I, you know, if I know your genetic makeup, I can tell you whether caffeine's a, you know, a, a performance of cancer for you at this time, uh, you know, as opposed to somebody else that is, that's, that's actually probably not a good idea for you, right? So as that science catches up and, and the cost of that, that testing goes down. So I think in, in my vision in, you know, less than 10 years, if we have a, you know, a cheek swab, a, a finger stick, and a you know microbiome sample. There's very little I couldn't individualize about you, which used to take months to figure out. Oh wow! So, um, I think I think that's part of it is is getting to the point where you get you get the access to those data points that that professional athletes do have, and that's a uh, that's a huge shift in the last couple of years. Both uh, people taking uh, kind of ownership of their their you know their their medical information, but also assessing it, you know, and then, and then you throw the kind of Theranos in the mix. And now people are really aware of what their bio data means and how powerful it can be to make decisions for themselves. So, um, I think that's going to be the shift that'll get people from that, you know, the guesswork to that kind of individual prescription. It's incredibly exciting. There's so many people that just want to, they walk and like, tell me everything about myself. And right. I'm like, well, I can't yet. I have, there's a lot of questions we have. And <laughs> this, this, this is even, this is even deeper, which is so exciting because who like people want to know how they differentiate between everybody else. Um, and so, you know, how this comes out is so incredibly um, exciting. 
And so on the performance end, that's where things are headed. Now, I'm very curious about that cognition side, yeah. right? We have people that are thinking, I want to, I, I definitely want to perform better in the gym, want bigger muscles, I want to lose body fat, but I also want to be able to perform extremely well at work. I want to think quicker. I want to be more focused. And this is kind of getting into a lot of things around, um, I guess, and I'm kind of curious if you look at the word like uh, nootropics uh, and also adaptogens, I, are these kind of dirty words to you or are these, is this like the actual term that you would use? And then where is the science of this right now? And should we be looking uh, at ashwagandha and should we be looking at all these other kind of supplements to really help kind of ele elevate our performance in the office? Just to be clear, are we talking about the pill from Limitless? With Bradley Cooper, is that what we're talking about right now? That's where I think I'm hoping we're going. <laughs> Joel, does it exist? Yeah. Can uh, I have we've it? got a pretty strong R and D team, so uh, I'll let you know okay, how, keep, uh, keep me how far along we are in that. <laughs> um, but no, to your point, like I do think, and, and this is another thing that's kind of was a, a paradigm shift for me relatively early on for me, but uh, for a lot of practitioners and just clients, it's, it's understanding that, yeah, supplementation is a tool, right? Now, a tackle box of supplements and no solid foundation, that's not going to work. But like, uh, you know, and it was the, you know, there's back then I'm old enough that uh, we were, there was a time when we were arguing the benefits of, of protein, you know, on a strength trained athlete, mm. uh, you know, and, and, you know, I, I was able to flip it. I was like, okay, so I see you, we've got somebody with these, you know, damaged markers. What are they, you know, what are you going to do? Like, Oh, I'll go as high as, you know, 2.2 um, grams per, per kilo. So one gram per pound. Uh, so I was like, okay, so now this football player that's doing it two days with all this muscle damage, but a, a gram of protein per pound isn't applicable in that sentence or that case. And that's when people are like, oh, okay, that was, a, I was like, okay, so design me, I've got a 300 pound football player, you know, design me a, a, a meal plan that he can physically eat, you know, comfortably from a, you know, just a, a gut perspective. And then uh, with the timing that's available to him, and, you know, a lot of times it is, it is it's borderline impossible. Well, it's technically possible to design the perfect diet to hit every need. Uh, the compliance and the the cost of doing that isn't necessarily always available. And then now you think about our urban athletes, and I specifically think about and remember high school athletes, where you've got you know 15 minutes of between classes and you know one hour lunch at that, and so you're running all day. You're using your brain, like you said, the cognitive performance. So where you know we've got the, the nutrients that need to fuel that, and then you know we're maybe going to grab something out of a vending machine. You know, back when I was you know in high school, and and and, and then try and perform you know our sport. So now we're in our you know twelfth to fifteenth hour of the day, um, off potentially a, a horrible public school lunch, right? So in that in that situation, you know, is 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 a supplement is a plan. You know, it could be as you know as you know, tell every athlete, if you don't have backup, you know, snacks or top off meals in your locker, in your gym bag, in your car, that's when you make the poor decisions. Mm. I need something. Right. Mm. But, uh, I think I went a little tangential there, but, um, just kind of want to re refocus on, um, I don't know what, what, uh, what question did I, what part of that question did I answer? <laughs> I got a little fired up. I get excited about things. No, I love it because you are just reinforcing the, uh, the basic idea of our foundational nutrition. If you, know, if you, if you, if you aren't eating well, um, it's not, it's not going to help your performance or your cognitive performance in any way. And I think the challenges that we see college athletes, high school athletes, uh, even urban athletes having just, you know, they don't have time, you know, there's even financial challenges not mm -hmm. having like the money around. So when we, when we start to talk about elevating the cognitive side of things, it's like, well, are you even eating enough calories to fuel your brain? Are you just eating, are you eating a lot of processed crap? That's not even going to be able to fuel. Like, are you, are you, are you someone who's overly restricting fat? So now things just like the metabolic side and the hormone development is actually incredibly, uh, you know, harmed within your body. So we don't want to be pushing the idea of, you know, anything like a nootropic or anything um, uh, like an adaptogen before all that's there. So we think you were just reinforcing that, which is great. Um, and I think I'm curious now and where Joe is kind of going with this limitless thing was how can, if someone's really checked off those boxes of sleeping well, eating well, not overtraining, um, 
from your side and the position that you sit in at Thorne, have you seen great research? Have you seen good evidence where people can actually elevate their cognitive performance by uh, utilizing some supplements? Yeah, so I think I think it's, it's there's a couple different couple different um, phases to that, right? So yeah, for sure, um, taking the idea just like you know I said 15 years ago or 20 years ago, sports nutrition was in its infancy and fueling that the that kind of uh, physical performance and metabolic needs uh, under stopping and putting a plan around the brain. It's always been true, right? The brain's always been a huge drain of calories, right? But it's it's kind of recognizing it as a, a system and a kind of a, a not a muscle, but a muscle in its own, right? That, that can be, um, it is just like sports nutrition was, it is an, an edge in a, an area that where research is catching up. Right. So, um, when it comes to nootropics and, and adaptogens, I think there is a place, like I said, what, I, what do I think? What do I know? What can I prove? Um, I'm, I'm, I've moved it into the, from the, what I think to what I know and, and other people are starting to prove. And, um, you know, there's always that, okay, so this works, you know, in a textbook world or in a test tube or, you know, an animal study, like awesome, but we've seen so many things work that way and fail in the real world, right? Just because mm. there are so many other variables, but, um, so there are, but it is growing a model where every day I'm moving things from, the, you know, to what I think to what I know to what we've proven. Right. So, so it is kind of growing, but, um, then there's also kind of the, as a performer, is it, will this potentially give me an edge or is this something that will it do no harm and potentially some good? Sure. And what's my comfort level with the athlete or myself if I am coaching myself? Um, you know, am I willing to do this? And I think there's some of that, that, that there as well. So um, I think I think some of the things we're doing is just making doing the education around. Okay, like, hey, you need B vitamins to make neurotransmitters. Every time your brain fires, you're using them. Right? The brain needs so many calories. It has, you know, it's where we store healthy fats, right? So. Um, these are all things like, okay, so is that part of our, just our general, you know, nutrition, just like, you know, if I'm, if I'm running a marathon, like my carbohydrate needs are pretty, are higher than when I'm not, right? Uh, if I'm using my brain nonstop, if I'm a NASCAR driver, that's nonstop stimulus for, you know, so many laps, uh, what is the drain and what's my answer for that? So, so it's, it's not necessarily, um, you know, supplementing just a supplement, it's supplementing because the demands of the sport or of life are higher than your baseline, right? So it's understanding what nutrients go into to your brain firing, right? So then that that's kind of basic. And that's when, you know, kind of the nerds of us, we stop at, step, step back and think like, okay, this is pretty obvious. Like, like I said, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of truth to the, the human body that hasn't changed all that much, right? We know the substrates that are needed. Um, we know how the body, you know, responds, reacts and kind of triggers things downstream. So we know all that. It's just a matter of stepping back and looking at, okay, what, what am I doing? Like, what are the demands of my day? Right. So when it comes to cognitive performers, we see a lot of that, um, you know, and sometimes it can be as simple as like, you know, there's so much water that, you know, where we, I've worked with some, you know, esports gamers where they just don't drink enough fluid right so mm. their brains are dry a little bit right so cognition is going to drop there and part of it is just uh it, it's there's no attention there's no fuel or hydration plan but then you start talking like well we, we don't have breaks so we can't you know we can't be taking back and breaks like we can't have that affecting our play so it's like okay let's get okay what are the electrolytes you need can we manage that in a smaller fluid volume these are all little things that like i would never have thought to think about but until you look at it you step back and you look at it like Again, it's pretty easy. What are the demands for survival? What are the demands for performance? Do we have an answer for every one of those? And that's mm. where, that's where I think uh, you know a lot of stuff we talk about, just like with the magnesium, the vitamin D for for athletes, those foundational elements are the things that tend to actually change performance a little bit faster, right? Because that is a that deficiency alone is a threat to survival, right? So then, if that's taken care of, that's a little bit extra energy the body has to focus somewhere else, right? So. Um, but then, you know, you look at it from the other side, from the top there, I mean, I do think there are things like, you know, adaptogens. So, so there's some that, you know, you mentioned ashwagandha that works kind of on the adrenal gland, which kind of controls a lot of the, the hormones and different kind of stress responses that we have, you know, and then you've got something like, uh, like rhodiola that kind of helps on the, the neurotransmitter side. Uh, you know, you've got the actual neurotransmitters. So, you know, we work with some people uh, like GABA is a transmitter that kind of helps with stress. Um, kind of the way we put, put, kind of puts the brakes on the stress response, right? So depending on that, like, especially if it is just the physical one where 
uh, it's something you can't control. You're you're going to be on the subway in New York City, right? Are you going to be traveling multiple time zones? It's, these are things like this stress is true. There's nothing I can do. And go top down um, and go performance, like look for a very specific performance goal. What is science saying either may help or has been proven to help, right? So um, I think I think you kind of have to look at it both ways. But for me, if you're not doing the foundation, I'm not sure your body's ever ready for that highest level of the, the performance down. 100%. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, so Joel, I you know, this has been a phenomenal conversation. And I, I want to, I hope we can have you back, Joel, because there's a lot more that I think we could really dive into, to be honest. I know there's a lot of questions that we even talked about on our call with you. Um, and I'm just a big fan of Thorne. I know Ryan is too. So I'm sure we could talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I'd love to have you back. But kind of as a closing kind of remark, Joel, do you, do you have just for, um, you know, first of all, having a baseline understanding of you got to have certain things in check before you really recommend supplements. I know we're trying to get food first as the priority, trying to do things kind of naturally, but if for the person that's ready for that, maybe 1% trying to get a little bit better talking to that kind of urban athlete, right? Do you have generally certain supplements that you typically kind of recommend for people to, to look at when they're kind of getting, look for someone that's not been using any supplements maybe at all? I, I always go on um, kind of uh, outcome based, right? That's kind of the way we, we, we call it, what do I take and why and how do we coach someone on that journey, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, and I do think a lot of times you can be concurrently having a great, you know, diet and nutrient plan and eating something. So I was talking about vitamin D as a perfect example. Like I just moved from Scottsdale, Arizona, where, you know, I had, you know, low on a, you know, low in the country, access to strong sun year round. Uh, I just moved to New England. So even if I do everything correct, there's three months of the year, the sun's not just not strong enough for me to get enough vitamin D yeah. and, and diet wise, it's just not, I find me a diet that meets my needs and you know, I'll be shocked. Right. So, um, so there are times when supplementation, it, it is a necessary part of diet due to restriction or, um, you know, uh, allergies or whatnot, or any, you know, anytime you're, you're removing a group of foods that, you know, supplementation, it, it can be very common for it to be concurrent. Right. And I do find that, but so to, to answer your question, uh, like, what do I take and why I, I was looking at an outcome, like what's the biggest stress. Most people can figure out, like, I need more energy. I need more sleep. I need, you know, my diet is not, I don't eat fruits and vegetables. I know I'm lacking that. So what's kind of one thing you identify. And then, you know, we have, uh, you know, so we like I said, we're, we're really trying to be intentional bringing uh, that one size fits one prescription to you, prescription is the word, but uh, recommendation to you. Um, so we have a series of, you know, quizzes if you have, if you know nothing, right? Like I just want to, you know, or it's like, Hey, I know I want to take a probiotic. I, I'm interested in gut health and that's yep. cool. another hour on gut health. Right. Right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so we've got some kind of guided quizzes there, but we also, uh, God, that's that maybe a, a three parter. Right. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but then we've also got, uh, we've, we've taken some, some causes, right. So we have, we've bundled some products together that are most common, uh, to, to, you know, that we would most commonly recommend to someone in a specific group. So it's, if you know you need sleep, if you're training or you're, you know, you endurance or, you know, you've got, uh, you want to support your, your body's response to inflammation and those kind of things. So we've got, we've done a little bit of, of one step for you. Uh, and I like to get people, I, I don't recommend necessarily, especially if you're, if you're, um, I, I'm a big fan of, uh, doing little mini, you know, and of one experiments on yourself uh, uh, and mm. changing one or two things and doing a small assessment period. Like, is this working for me right now? You know, some of the sleep stuff, you, you, you may notice like that day, right? Something like a fish oil or, or whatnot may need some time to, to kind of ramp up. So uh, one of the biggest mistakes in, in supplementation is uh, not taking them long enough or consistent enough, right? So um, I, I've heard so many people like, this doesn't work. I was like, well, no, I mean, science is differently. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so a lot of times it is the compliance or the, you know, are you taking, is it a with food one? Are you taking it without food? Like there's all kinds of ways of supplement can work but i mean the number one thing is finding a company uh so doing your your research and and, and finding companies like foreign that do invest in quality and and whatnot because it, it is a i don't want to say unregulated but there's rooms for some people to make money without uh providing a benefit and then there's the, mm. the top tier companies that you know realize it's a significant cost to put out a quality product and you know, that's kind of where, where Thorne and, and very few others shine, you know, where there's, if you look at a supplement company, you know, like I said, we, we do research on products where 
partner with the Mayo Clinic, um, you know, we're, we're the only company they'll do supplement research with. So looking at like a, a company that really is like we're, we're a kind of science and, and kind of wellness company that has some products we're supplementing in. But, but what we're really trying to, to get you is an outcome, right? So what is that outcome you're looking for? And then to kind of go backwards and figure out what are the products that best support that. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, <clears throat> you know, kind of Thorne's kind of uh, endeavor to, to, to lead the, lead the industry and in, in kind of shrinking that barrier to, to personal information. Right. So um, another thing, so if you are curious or if you're doing a, a, an intervention and you want, we have a, a kind of at home tests without having to go through a full phlebotomy lab. We have right. ones that, you know, measure stress, measure sleep. And, and I'm a big fan of, okay, test, uh, make it, make it, you know, figure out what my plan is, both, you know, physical, uh, mental, spiritual, whatever. What, what am I going to do to improve? Did I actually improve? Because I can feel it, but like, it's always great to get that. Yeah, no, but the lab work proved it, right? So um, again, we're trying to, to shrink that cost of, and access to the, that information. So uh, I'm a huge fan of the the kind of, like I said, the, the N, of, N of one. So, you know, subject of one, uh, experimentation on yourself, you know, and it, uh, what, what the reason I like that among other things is it forces you to do that introspection, right? And do that checklist of, okay, I made, I'm, I'm committing to this protocol. Let's see if it works. Right. And it's why you've got the, you know, the 30 day challenges or these things, they, they have so much of impact one, because, you know, people actually comply to them and, and make the, you know, the, the commitment and the intention to do it every day for 30 days. That's, that's easy, but also uh, it's kind of that I can commit to 30 days, right? You check off each day on the, on the calendar, yeah, but it mm-hmm. becomes routine and it becomes part of your, um, your habit, but you start seeing building on that kind of improvement in whether it is improvement in strength, improvement in energy, whatever your you know, improvement in sleep, but those build every day. And now you're at the end of that 30 days, I'm a new person. What's my new challenge? What's the next thing I need to fix? You know, I need to keep this going, but, you know, so I think that's kind of that forced uh, kind of um, innovation, right? You always have to be innovating with how you're how you're improving, and it's you know whether it's health or performance or whatnot. Um, you know, anytime you make an intention, make an intervention, get the outcomes from it, and continue to grow from that. That's when you know it becomes a lifestyle, and you become you know a healthier you, a higher performing you. Uh, it's those little consecutive wins. That's beautiful. That's great. That's, Beautiful. That's helpful. I feel like, again, I think that we are reinforcing the idea that we need to have that foundation of nutrition. And I love that right now you're also reinforcing the idea that really, tell me if I'm wrong here, you're letting everyone know that, yes, we can tell you supplements that can definitely support you, but you have to be able to really reflect in yourself and then apply it but then you still have to continue that reflection if you're gonna if you're gonna bring magnesium in you got to give it time and you have to be able to understand maybe what to look for and uh you can't just jump to conclusions i think there are a lot of people i mean yeah creatine is a huge thing or people kind of take it for three days and like i'm not seeing anything i'm done um and it's like but there's so much research behind it it can help us out so um i love this and yeah we would love to have you back and kind of dive deeper into you know even into improvements in sleep and how we can make sure that that is something that God, we understand. Yeah. Um, I think gut health was something that we had brought up in a previous conversation as well. But really, Joel, thank you so much for your time today and your expertise and just really being, uh, you know, this, this great light within the industry. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you guys for, for this platform. I think it's, uh, it's a community that's going to impact a lot of people. And yeah, I mean, I, I've got about 10 different, uh, you know, podcast topics. We could spend an hour on each. So, uh, you know, and that's just from an hour conversation. So, uh, okay. happy to revisit or kind of, you know, field, uh, field some questions for, for, uh, further episodes. So, that's perfect. We'll do, it. we'll do it again, Joel. We'll <laughs> do it so another much, time. All right, man. Looking forward to it. I Appreciate love it. it. Thanks All so right. much, man.